So welcome everyone. My name is Marisa Gomez and I'm the public programs manager at the Santa Cruz Museum of Natural History. And I'm excited to be joined tonight by our speaker, Josie Lesage, um, who's already said hi a little. Um, before I bring you back in, Josie, though, I do just have like a few bits of housekeeping to get through for us. So I want to make sure that I acknowledge that Today, we're gonna to be considering um, fire's impact on a landscape. And this is part of our series, uh, the CZU Lightning Complex and Community Science Project. So we're thinking about our own burn zone up here in Santa Cruz too. So I wanna to acknowledge that the fires impacted the ancestral lands of the Awaswas and Ramatish speaking Kiriste, Sayanta, Yupi, Chitoni, and Ashistaka. And today these lands are stewarded by the Amamutsin Tribal Band who are working hard to fulfill their obligation to creator, to care for and steward mother earth and all living things through relearning efforts and the Amundsen Land Trust. Another just uh, thing I wanted to cover, um, which I already sort of mentioned is that we're gonna be communicating through the chat tonight. There's also a Q&A feature that you're welcome to use. Um, if you could please switch who you're sending your messages to um, from the default, which is host and panelists to the option for everyone, that way we can all communicate with each other. It's just more fun. And I threw together even another prompt for you. Um, if it suits your fancy, uh, consider what is the purpose of your hikes? Because tonight's talk is called um, Hiking with a Purpose. So we're going to be thinking about that today. But why do you go out in nature? What do you get out of your, your nature walks and your hikes? And if you want to answer that, please do so in the chat. And then um, again, Tonight's program is in support of the museum CZU Lightning Complex and Community Science Project, which we launched in the spring in partnership with the California Native Plant Society and the Kenneth S. Norris Center for Natural History up at UC Santa Cruz. And um, this project really is all to do in many ways with us talking with our speaker tonight, Josie. Um, so, Back when the fires occurred in the Santa Cruz Mountains in August of 2020, obviously there was a lot on our minds and a lot going on in our community, but the museum quickly started thinking about how this is such a unique time for our region and such an impactful event for the ecology of our area. And we really wanted to figure out ways that we could help engage our community in better understanding how the fires are impacting these landscapes. And so um, one of our board members recommended that we reach out to Josie, who he used to work with um, while she had her time up at UC Santa Cruz uh, to learn about the work that she's been doing at the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden and get some inspiration for our own project. And that conversation spurred so many conversations um, for us to figure out what was appropriate for our community at this time. And it's still an ongoing process of figuring out the best way um, to, to reach our goals and to help support the land managers and research, researchers that are out there doing this work in the burn zone right now. Um, but so I just want to start by thanking you, Josie, for helping getting us started. <laughs> and, um, and to thank you so much for for being here tonight. I think what I'm really looking forward to is I think feeling inspired by all the great work that you guys are doing um, and continuing to think about what we can do here in Santa Cruz. So thank you, Josie, and I'll let you take it away now. Thank you. Yeah, you're very welcome. And my computer has naturally decided now is the time to not work. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Even after a trial run, who would have thought? <laughs> No okay, worries. Here we go. It always comes back um, in order eventually. It does. All right. Is my screen getting shared? Yeah, it's in the process. It usually takes a second or two, but we are now seeing a black screen and we are seeing your first slide. All right. Great. <laughs> um, hi, folks. Thanks for bearing with me through the momentary technical difficulties. Um, I'm Dr. Josie Lesage. I'm um, down at the Santa Barbara, Santa Barbara Botanic Garden. And uh, today I'm going to talk to you about a project that we've been um, conducting looking at post-fire ecosystems in the Thomas Fire Scar. Uh, and this is a project that's 
a collaboration between the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden and the Conservation Biology Institute. And it's supported by um, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife through Proposition 1 funding um, for watershed recovery. And so just to get started, um, to introduce myself so that you kind of know who I am, uh, I'm the applied ecologist at the Santa Barbara Botanic, Santa Barbara Botanic Garden. Can't believe how hard that is to say tonight. Um, I study the relationships between plants and their environments and how we can use those relationships to care for our local habitats. So how do the relationships between plants and the places they're living, um, how can we take those and use them to our advantage to help with conservation and restoration efforts? I'm also very interested in community science and helping others find ways to steward the environments that they're living in and working in. And I work at the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden, which doesn't look quite this spectacular right now, but is still a beautiful place to visit. Um, so this is peak season in April or May. So if you ever come down to visit, that's the right time to do it. But our mission at the garden is to conserve California's native plants and habitats for the health and well-being of both people and the planet. And I think this is a really great project that shows that intersection of plants, people, and um, how ecosystems aren't just nature, but that we're sort of a part of the system. And so with that out of the way, I'm gonna get started on the presentation. Um, I'll start today by giving you a bit of an ecological setting of fire, California, and invasive species. And so what drove us to do this project? Then I'm gonna give you the project overview. So who was involved? What did we do? How did we do it? And finally, I'm gonna talk about some key outcomes and the future work that's planned for this. So without further ado, this is the um, Romero Canyon fire scar of the Thomas fire. I think this is a really cool photo and I think everybody can see my cursor, but um, this line right here shows really well what the burned chaparral in our area looks like compared to unburned. So you can see a dramatic loss of vegetation cover here. Uh oh, have I frozen? There we go. Okay. Ooh. So, the very, very basic place to start is why would we care about plants? Uh, we should care about plants because they do a lot for us. So, they provide us with clean air and water, food and medicine. They retain our soils and they help us with uh, slope stability. And they're important parts of climate regulation and resilience to disturbance. So, Plants are really the foundation of life in terrestrial ecosystems on Earth. Without plants, we certainly would not be able to inhabit terrestrial systems. Uh, the other reason I think you should care about plants is they're just cool. They have a lot of unique adaptations um, and there's a lot of biodiversity and variety in plants that I just love to nerd out on. Uh, and so I hope by the end of this, you'll nerd out on some of it too. Um, What's interesting also about California plants is that they are well adapted to recover after fire. So many species of native California plants in ecosystems where fire is common have seeds that are cued by fire chemicals or by the heat of the fire itself um, and only germinate following fire. Additionally, there are some shrubs uh, like this gorgeous manzanita here that re-sprout readily from root burls after fire. So a lot of our native ecosystems are really adapted to this disturbance. But with the caveat that post-fire bare soils are at risk of erosion and invasion for a period until the vegetation recovers. And I've mentioned that fire is a natural occurrence in California, but this varies from region to region. So I'm going to talk specifically about down here in Santa Barbara, where it's a little, a little different um, from Santa Cruz. But fires in our area would occur naturally every 30 to 100 years. Um, intensity varies by habitat that they're in, but there's evidence that both the frequency and size of fires in California have increased over time. And this is really driving a question of how does this increase in fire frequency and fire size affect the recovery of the ecosystems in an area? We know a little bit about high fire frequency. So in your standard chaparral system, 
you might have a mature stand of chaparral and a natural 30 to 100 year fire cycle. And with this long-term fire cycle, that's enough time for the shrubs to either grow back up from seed or re-sprout and re-establish their root burl um, sort of stores, right? So if you've got a store of nutrients underground that you're drawing on to re-sprout, hopefully you have enough time to do a lot of photosynthesis above ground and put sugar back into the earth so that when you get burned next time you can re-sprout. So on a natural 30 to 100 year fire cycle, mature chaparral can replace itself very well. However, if you've got a sequence of frequent fires, so say every 10 years or less, you have another fire occur in the same area, what can happen is that this mature chaparral doesn't have the means by which to replace itself. So the shrubs aren't getting big enough to set seed and um, they're also not replenishing their root burl enough to re-sprout that regularly. And so when that happens, the chaparral can get converted into um, invasive annual grassland or coastal sage scrub or a different ecosystem type. Um, in the case of annual grasslands, these systems are often very fine fuels that dry out and can be more flammable or um, more prone to having fire travel through them. So that's frequency. Um, additionally, if you get to the point where shrubs aren't able to resprout or regrow, or there aren't seeds in the seed bank to regrow, you might lose some of your vegetation's um, soil holding capacity. And so erosion becomes a greater risk. And this is something that was demonstrated um, quite aggressively and violently in the um, mudslides in Montecito following the Thomas fire. Um, so. The other question is how does fire size affect fire recovery? Um, and this, ah, this is a hard thing to talk about because when I first gave a version of this presentation to get people involved in this project, um, I was out there saying, you know, oh yeah, Thomas Fire Scar, second largest, um, even by the time of it, um, or of us working on this project, it was the second largest. Now it is the ninth largest recorded fire in California. Um, so since 2018, when it was considered the largest, it's already dropped all the way down to ninth place. Um, and fires are getting bigger. And so with these huge fire scars, a big question is how will the ecosystem recover if the footprint is so large? Um, when you've got potentially no seed source for miles and miles around you, what does that look like? Additionally, you're crossing into different ecosystem types. So in the Thomas fire scar, this is a, bit of an exaggeration just to show what's out there, but the main three ecosystem types are mixed chaparral, coastal oak woodland really high up on these um, north facing slopes, and then coastal scrub lower down in the fire scar. Um, but you can see it's mostly chaparral, lots of shrubs. I love the broccoli shrubs, so this is great for me, um, even though it's very difficult to walk through. But uh, those are the three main types of ecosystems. This is what they look like in case you haven't gotten down here to walk through them, but we've got our little broccoli shrub chaparral. We have riparian corridors, which in our area are generally very restricted to just an ephemeral stream that is there for four or five months and then starts running underground or disappears entirely. Uh, we've got some grasslands in some places where um, fires have occurred multiple times. We've got our oak woodlands on the north facing slopes and we've got the conifer woodlands. So if you've never walked through those, those are some quick pictures just to show you what they look like. Um, and each of these systems includes a variety of different species, some native, some non-native. And so this is where this is gonna turn into a little bit of a classroom lecture on different types of species in case you're not familiar with these terms. So some key terminology, uh, a native species is a species that evolved in an area it's from that area in a sort of deep time context. Uh, so it's been there for a long, long period of time. A non-native species is just the opposite. So it's a species that arrives in an area and did not evolve in that system in that deep time context. So it's a fairly new arrival, maybe only 100, 200, 300 years, um, but it has established itself in that area. There's also the term invasive. And an invasive species is a non-native species most of the time that can rapidly outcompete other species and cause harm to the ecosystem, whether that's by um, 
becoming a monoculture or changing soil salinity or something like that, an invasive species is generally one we think of as being very successful and able to cause harm. I just want to make the distinction that not all native species or not all non-native species are invasive species. So there are plenty of non-native species that do not become terrible invaders. Um, they might just sort of be a nuisance here and there, but they're not the widespread invaders that we're really concerned about. Okay, so this might make you wonder what makes an invasive species invasive and how do they get around? Well, oftentimes invaders are just better competitors or they arrive in an area where a natural predator is missing. And so they take advantage of these conditions where everyone else might be limited by something, but they're not. And so they can really, you know, just go gangbusters and grow like mad. In other times, there might be some kind of disturbance, um, such as a fire or really any kind of disturbance that allows the invader to have sort of a boom. It arrives after this in in disturbance and it can take advantage of the new conditions much better than what was there historically. And the most common way that invasive species move around is by humans. So we are very good at moving things around the planet. Um, and that's generally how things get around, at least in the Thomas fire. Uh, a lot of the species that we see were originally brought by humans intentionally and sometimes unintentionally. And uh, they're a huge problem. <laughs> invasive species are a great threat to biodiversity. So. I'm going to play this little video. Um, I'll pause in the middle, but just take in the scenes here. All right, Ooh, a little too far. Where's it good? There we go. So here you can see what a native ecosystem in this area might look like. Uh, those broccoli bush, chaparral, shrubs that I mentioned. And here is, there's some Amsinchia in this, I will admit there's some native plants, but this is mostly non-native uh, Eurasian annual grasses. So these are those golden rolling hills of California. If you take the 101 uh, from Santa Cruz down to Santa Barbara and you pass through Paso Robles and you're like, wow, look at those beautiful golden hills. Unfortunately, they are overwhelmingly covered by non-native species, um, non-native invasive grasses. And so if you could imagine what this would be like, uh, if these annual grasses were not here, it would just be shrubs, non-stop shrubs. Um, and so this really shows the ability of invasive species to take over an ecosystem. So other invasive species you might be familiar with are tamarisk in southwestern um, riparian systems. Tamarisk can increase soil salinity um, and drive out native vegetation. And here's Cape ivy, which we've got some of in Santa Barbara too, but it just covers whatever it is growing on. It can it's kind of impressive um, in a terrifying way. There we go. Um, and then this is one of the only graphs I will show, just a fair warning, um, but uh, it'll come back later. So I just wanna cover it really thoroughly. So this is the abundance uh, or number of individuals of an invasive species and the cost of the eradication of the invisible, uh, invasive species moving up along the x-axis, sorry, y-axis. And over the x-axis, we've got time. So imagine you've drawn a little S-shaped curve here. Initially, we have very few species and later on we have a lot and they're a lot more expensive to remove. When an invasive species arrives, it's first introduced, there's very little of it and it might uh, start expanding a little bit and we'll have our first early detections. And so this early period is where proactive management um, really, this is like the best time to catch an invasive species, right? If you catch it at this stage, you might be able to eradicate it. You recognize it's not from there and you can get rid of all of the populations because there's really not that many yet. However, very frequently after these early detections, for whatever reason, we can't do anything yet or we don't know what to do yet. And so oftentimes it spreads a little bit more and then land managers start beginning their interventions um, a little bit later down the line. And often the public becomes aware of the problem even later than that. And so in this period, you've got sort of the options for eradication. It's gonna be intensive, it's gonna be expensive, it's gonna be difficult. So that's sort of the active management phase. Then 
at the very tippy end, you're going to have what we're calling reactive management, where really only local isolated management is possible. So if you know that there's um, a rare plant in an area or it's a desirable habitat for some other reason and you don't want the invader, invasive species there, that's when you're going to be doing your reactive management on a much smaller scale. Complete eradication from the system is likely impossible. Unless you've got a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of time and money. All right. And so when you hit that end of the curve, that's where you're protecting and restoring the small pockets. And so sometimes folks see that curve and they say, well, if we get to that end, what's the point? Um, and I fight strongly against that. I think there's still a point. We have all this beautiful native biodiversity to protect even when we get to that point. And so um, at that point, we're really trying to prioritize, okay, where do we put our efforts? How do we most effectively spend our time and money? All right, we've made it through the classroom portion of the meeting. Um, it's time to talk about the project. So with that background under our belts, we at the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden were interested in surveying the Thomas Fire Scar to understand the areas that were in need of some sort of help. So we were going to go out into the Fire Scar and map where we found invasive species and where we found rare species. Um, and to identify areas that would you know, need help, places where there was obvious signs of erosion, where native species were not recovering, where there were other signs of some sort of environmental damage. Um, we also wanted to engage our community. Um, part of this is that with a team of four or five people, you can only cover so much ground in a year. Um, another part of this is that oftentimes the community has a lot of fantastic knowledge. People are already out hiking, walking their dogs, visiting these places. And so developing um, a community of volunteer botanists who can go out and provide quality data is fantastic. Um, so that was really one of the goals of our project was to develop this community of people who are excited to get outside learn more about the area um, and get involved. And so those were some fantastic people. Um, we had, <laughs> we started in 2019 with our registrations and we had our first trainings in early 2020. We had 200 people sign up initially and then we had a pandemic. Uh, so by the end of everything, we had 58 participants in 2020 and 50 in 2021. Um, I look back fondly on these photos. These are our classroom and field trainings to get people familiar with some of the weeds in the area, um, to get people you know, looking, how do you make an observation, et cetera. Um, yeah, it was a good time. <laughs> uh, and these folks had a range of botanical skills. So we had you know, newbies who were just uh, looking at plants for the first time and getting to see all these complex little parts and all this biodiversity all the way up to the grizzled veterans of dichotomous keys who you know, know things that I have no idea about. So we had the full range of botanical skill um, with our volunteers. And in total, I think volunteers spent somewhere probably over 400 hours collecting data. So that's an incredible amount of work. And I am so, so, so thankful for the work that they did helping us identify um, these places and these species. So what were we all looking for? We had a list of focal invasive species. These are species that were rated by the California Department of Fish and Agri uh, wow, uh, Food and Agriculture as A rank or highly invasive noxious weeds, um, things that were on the Cal Ipsy high rank or things that had a Cal Ipsy watch list warning. Uh, so it's a smattering of different weeds. And then also because we were working so closely with the Los Padres Forest Service, um, or uh, we also looked at Forest Service weeds of interest. For the rare species, these are any rare species that were listed by CNPS as rare and were known to occur in sort of the region. So in Santa Barbara, Ventura County, in the habitats we were looking at. And then finally, we also had um, an app that would help us collect signs of erosion or other landscape damage. So all of our data collection was app-based in either iNaturalist for the species level data or in an app called Anic Data. 
for the erosion or landscape level data. Uh, so all you really needed to partake was a telephone or a smartphone that could um, take photos. And this is a map of the area we covered. So to orient you a little bit, Santa Cruz is going to be way, way, way off the screen. Um, but here is downtown Santa Barbara proper. Here's the city uh, or town of Ojai, if you are familiar with, with where that is. Um, all of this sort of green color is the Los Padres forest. And this orange overlay is the Thomas Fire boundary. And so in this map, we've got blue lines, orange lines, kind of burgundy, and then some gray. The gray are roads that we did not survey. Um, the way the grant was set up and land access is set up, uh, we mostly surveyed in either um, land trust property or in the Los Padres forest itself. We did not really survey down here because of difficulties with access. Um, but the orange lines then are our volunteer routes. So those are where our volunteers surveyed. The blue lines are staff routes. So where staff surveyed. Um, staff did a lot of covering of roads and places that are behind locked gates. So in the Los Padres, you often need a key to take a vehicle behind a gate. And so that's why we did a lot of this stuff that's sort of way, way deep into the forest. Um, and then these brown routes are routes that we were unable to survey uh, for whatever reason. And so in total, covered about 300 miles. Um, I know for sure that staff covered about 280 in total. Volunteers, because of how many there were, and uh, some volunteers decided to hike their route multiple times just to look at phenology over the season. There were many, many, many more hours contributed by volunteers. Um, or many more miles, sorry. Uh, we visited every maintained and accessible route. So some of these routes are actually um, dozer lines or fire breaks or fire roads uh, and are really not walkable uh, once vegetation starts growing on them. Uh, and I just wanna throw out there that we also surveyed in the Whittier Fire Star, but I'm not going to show that or talk about it today. But if you're curious about the Whittier Fire Star, um, it's an interesting spot. And I'm happy to talk about that more um, later. All right, so some key outcomes of our project now that you know what we did. Um, before we move along, I just want to show you what hiking in the Los Padres backcountry can be like. So this is a fuel break um, or a fire road that is running along this ridge line. And um, my field technician is right there. So you can really get a sense of the scale of being out there because the shrubs are so short. Um, well, short, they, they can be quite tall sometimes, but because there isn't a tree canopy, you can see for quite a ways and it makes for some really, really spectacular views. All right, so um, for key outcomes, I'm gonna break this down into invasive species, rare species, fire followers we saw, the spatial modeling component of our project, which we're working on right now, and um, a little bit about the value of volunteers and comparisons between volunteers and staff scientists that I'm hoping um, to do more analysis on later. So sorry for any abrupt transitions that are going to come up. All right, staff and volunteers collected over 6,000 observations. So we saw a lot of beautiful and interesting plants while we were out there. Um, it was really cool. I think we collected data on over 300, maybe even 350 taxa. So many, many species. Um, even though we had focal species, I strongly encouraged our volunteers to uh, collect data on anything they found interesting. So we have a lot of non-focal species data, but I think it's still pretty cool. Uh, once again, this is the map of our region um, and the area we were studying in. And so what does over 6,000 data points look like on a map? Looks like that. So we collected data, you can see really densely here in uh, the Santa Barbara front country um, and volunteers collected a lot of data right here up above Ojai as well. Um, it's a lot. <laughs> so our invasive species data. As I said, about half of the data we collected focused on our focal invasive species. Um, in this map, 
The focal invasive species are these orange dots. The focal rare species are the teal dots and the gray dots are the non-focal species. So what you can tell from this right away is that some of our volunteers got really into collecting data on basically every plant they saw, which I fully encourage. iNaturalist is a great resource to just learn the flora in your area. Um, but we also got a lot of really great invasive plant data from our volunteers. Um, and we really expanded what our known distributions are and where those are located. And so as an example of that, I'm, I'm gonna pull out just one species. Uh, actually, I'm gonna first tell you about all of the species we had, I'm sorry, um, or the top 10. So we had a lot of the really common invasives uh, that I think probably are also in Santa Cruz, things like fennel, Maltese and yellow star thistle. Um, in Ojai, there is a growing population of cheatgrass, which appears to be slowly making its way into Santa Barbara. Uh, sticky snake root, agaritina, I'm not sure if that's up in your area, but whew, there's a lot of that here now. Uh, tree tobacco, Cape ivy, Spanish broom, um, just a lot of invasive species that are common and known. And so what this tells me is that, yeah, we collected a lot of good data. Um, if we focus in on just one example, the agaritina adenophora uh, or sticky snake root, this is what it looks like. I think it's almost kind of a cute plant until you realize how terrible it is. Um, it's very good at invading riparian areas. So here's our map. These purple dots, uh, this is now zoomed into just the Santa Barbara front country. So you can see the areas that are volunteer routes um, and then it's a bit difficult to see, but this kind of purplish color is volunteer and staff. Um, not that many dots. This is all of the data for where this plant is known from prior to 2019. So basically all of the data that was ever collected prior to the fire. Um, this is what we knew about this species distribution. And if you think back to our invasion curve, right, you might say, okay, there's a couple dots. It may be here, maybe we're at that early intervention stage and we can do something about this. Um, unfortunately, this is what the data looks like from our project. So we collected so many data points for where this plant is. It's really in pretty much every single riparian corridor um, in the Santa Barbara front country, unfortunately. And so with this knowledge under our belt, it's probably more appropriate to draw the arrow higher up on the invasion curve. Um, and this is really valuable knowledge for land managers who are considering which species to target with any sort of removal effort. So if you were basing this solely on data um, that didn't come out of this project, you might be putting money into something that might be much higher on the curve and might be better spent on something that is lower down. So the data collected by our volunteers is superb for informing these kinds of decisions. All right, rare species. This is the map of known locations of rare species. Um, something that I always get a kick out of in um, sort of just data collection generally is that people love knowing where the rare and the cool things are. And there's a lot less <laughs> records out there of invasive species. Um, so if you ever get the chance to do plant collecting, collect the invasive species you see, we need that data so much. Um, so this is the map of rare plants in the fire scar, uh, all the little purple triangles. And those are the known populations of these plants. This is the data we added. We added another 215 instances um, or populations. Some of these sort of lead together as far as populations go, but 215 instances of rare plants in the fire scar. Um, and these data were collected by both staff and volunteers. Um, just incredible amount of knowledge added about where these things are. Uh, and so because they're beautiful as well, I'm gonna throw in some photos. Uh, there were 17 at least rare plant taxa. It gets kind of tricky when you start thinking about subspecies um, versus species, but at least 17. And what I think is really cool is that some of these populations haven't been formally recorded since the 1940s. 
So there are cases where we knew that a rare plant was located on this one ridge based on one specimen that was collected in you know, 1942, um, but nobody has been back there to see it since. And um, we were able to fill a lot of those gaps and say, oh yeah, that seems to still be there. And we made a new collection for it, um, or at least an INAP point if the population didn't look healthy enough to take a collection from. Um, and again, just as I did for the invasive species, I wanna zoom in on one sort of case study, and that is Monardella hypoluca subspecies hypoluca. Um, Beautiful plant, smells kind of funky like most monardellas do. It's in the mint family. Um, this one is restricted to sort of the um, transverse ranges right above Santa Barbara and Ventura counties. Uh, it's a beautiful plant when it's in full bloom. Most of the year, it does not look anything like this because it doesn't have the flowers. And it's just a bunch of little green leaves, um, but it's a real cutie in my opinion. It was the subspecies, the rare subspecies was described in 2015, and uh, there are only 59 specimen records of this plant in existence on Earth. Um, how many populations there are is a little more fuzzy, especially because uh, we have a lot more data now. So one of our superstar volunteers uh, is a trail runner and posted a photo of this plant early on in our project. And I was like, oh my gosh, George, you need to, you know, this is like such an exciting find. This is a super restricted um, plant that's only known from a handful of places. Uh, if you see this again, would you record it? And he, he's a trail runner, so he loves going up and down the Santa Barbara front country. Uh, and he added 83 observations of this plant in different places in the front country. Just amazing, like vastly um, increasing our knowledge about where this plant is located. So super, super cool that you know, one volunteer is really able to drive so much knowledge generation for this one rare plant. Um, and because of that, we can, I, I feel pretty confident saying that this plant really likes burned areas because um, he's actually added it uh, for all of his trail running, not just in fire scars. And it's clear that it's in the cave fire scar, the Thomas fire scar. Uh, and so it really likes those fresh post burn areas. Uh, so speaking of things that like fresh uh, post-fire areas, I've got a quick cover of some fire followers in the Thomas fire. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on these, but I can't help share uh, some cool facts about what we saw out there. So some plants, as I mentioned early on in the talk, really respond dramatically to fire. They have a flush of their seed bank and they'll just cover an entire slope. Um, or it'll be a species that you really only see in the first year or two after fire because they need the char chemicals to stimulate germination in their seeds. And so one of those is Arendorferia chrysantha or golden eardrops. Uh, it's a gorgeous plant in the poppy family, Papaveraceae. Uh, and I just love it because look at how weird that is. So cool. Um, Emanthe penduliflora is another fire follower that we found frequently on our hikes, uh, also known as whispering bells. This is a fun one because if you get up close to smell it, um, it smells kind of like an old undershirt, like a really not pleasant kind of gross smell, uh, which is not what I expected from such a cute little flower. So the more you know, um, that one was a fun one to press. Uh, this is Dendromicon rigida, which I suspect might also be up in the Santa Cruz area, I'm not sure, um, but bush poppy. This one pops up just, I mean, like wildfire. It's, it's all over the place after fire, um, and it's a beautiful one. It's a great one if you're looking for a native plant in your yard. Uh, they tend to do well in horticultural settings. Um, and I have spelled it wrong, please ignore that. Cyrocarpus multiflorus or Sierra snapdragon is a cool one that we saw a lot of in the Thomas Fire as well. Um, I'm including this one mainly because I found a couple instances of it where it was not pink. So typically this plant is pink and white, but I found a few instances and some of our volunteers also found instances of it being um, just plain white, which I thought was pretty cool that we all saw mutations throughout the fire scar. Uh, Phasalia grandiflora is another gorgeous flower. Uh, as you can tell, these huge, huge flowers, bright purple, and it's really only present for the first year to two years after a fire. After that, 
there's not enough chemical in the char left um, after all those rains have washed through for these guys to germinate. So it's a really, really cool flower and you really only get to see it directly after fire. So it's really great to have people going out into fire scars right, uh, right away afterwards to track where these are popping up. Because um, you're not gonna see them if you're not out there right after fire. Acmospon grandiflorus is another one that does the same. This is just an incredible um, patch of it that we saw. I think we spent 15 to 20 minutes there just oogling over the bees that were present. And then finally, last and probably least on my list is going to be Tericula perii. Loves fire, pops up after fire, is a worse rash than poison oak. So while you're out in your fire, uh, post-fire area, if you see something that looks like this, it's just like fuzzy leaves, beautiful purple flowers, don't touch it. It's a mistake. Um, one of our field technicians learned the hard way. I think it lasts like two or three weeks. It's terrible. Um, but those are some fire followers. And really the only way to catch observations of these is to be out in the fire scar fairly close to the occurrence. All right, so the next two sections are gonna be some work in progress uh, sort of data uh, analysis, what we're planning on doing, not so much what we've done. Um, and so these will be about the erosion data and the spatial prioritiz prioritization tool. Um, we are still in the process of analyzing our erosion data. So we are combining this with broader scale spatial data um, like uh, Landsat data and um, ugh, DEM, um, shake stability, slope type, or soil type uh, data. But we have boots on the ground information about where we actually saw indications of erosion in slides. And so the goal with this data is to combine the boots on the ground data and the broader scale spatial data to answer questions about which areas are at greatest risk um, to downslope communities. So which areas that are currently eroding um, do we need to do interventions in? And are there patterns of slopes and soil types that are more likely to slip that we can look to as areas to do sort of pre-intervention potentially or to be ready in the future um, to help in? Uh, so this is sort of a sneak peek of the spatial prioritization tool that we're working on. So using that collected data and the pre-existing data, we're gonna identify those intervention areas. This is a model of fire severity. Um, as a boots on the ground ecologist, I'm always a bit leery about um, model data. And so I think this is a really cool opportunity where we're using our boots on the ground data to sort of compare and inform the spatial data. Uh, this is model data of the risk of soil slip within the Thomas fire scar. And then that combined with all of the data we're throwing at it is an, uh, this right here is the early model that we've produced of where intervention, key intervention areas are. And so not too surprisingly, some of the key intervention areas are gonna be watersheds above the more populated areas, particularly in Montecito. All right. The last thing I'm gonna cover, um, and I mostly included this because it's cool because we really have a lot of data analysis left to do, but I think it's really neat. Um, one of the key questions in this project is, do staff and volunteers collect data of the same quality, of the same type? Um, you know, if I send a newbie botanist out there, can they spot fennel? Can they spot any of these particular weeds? Uh, so we're still in the process of analyzing these, but I think this is so cool. Staff and community scientists often saw the same plants just a couple weeks apart or a month or two apart. So this is an observation posted by a community scientist in March of 20, uh, 2020. And you can see, if you pay attention to this rock, you'll see the split up here and a little shelf down here. Um, and then staff went by in April and you'll notice that the phenology on the plant has changed. So it's now flowering instead of not being flowering yet, but same split in the rock and the same shelf here. Uh, and so this to me says, at least in some cases, yeah, Community scientists can definitely collect quality data. Uh, this is another example of a fennel plant growing near a little um, drainage. 
So little foil is the indicator. This is the exact same plant seen in March and in June. Um, and I think this is super cool. I'm very excited to analyze the spatial data and to kind of look at exactly how comparable the data sets are. But I think this is fantastic evidence that at least for some of these larger showier plants, yes, it totally is worth it to have community scientists out collecting data. So in conclusion, community science data can inform a lot of questions. Uh, where are the invasive species? Where are they spreading? Where are the rare species? Um, and having both of those pieces of knowledge can help us identify areas where we might want to intervene to protect a rare species, even if the invasive species is kind of far gone. Um, where are fire followers present, right? We're not gonna know that unless somebody is out in a fire scar right after the fire. And then finally, where is erosion occurring or likely to occur? So our community science data is helping answer all of these questions. Um, and I have no doubt that since all of this data is public, uh, it can answer a lot more if anybody was interested in using it to answer other questions. And so all of that said, I just wanna send a huge, huge, huge thank you out to everyone who allowed us to access their land to the California Department of Fish and Wildlife and the Prop 1 funding for funding this project. REI helped us pre-pandemic arrange some of our early trainings. And um, the biggest thank you of all goes out to our wonderful community scientists who collected so much fantastic data. Uh, and thank you to you for being here today and listening to my presentation. That's all folks, and I can take questions. Thank you so much, Josie. Wow, you guys have been really busy. <laughs> And oh, yeah. I just love that. And I, you know, the last bit that you ended on with the volunteer observations versus the staff ones, the volunteer ones were when it was harder to identify too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, we tend to go out a little later in the season to make it easier on ourselves. And our volunteers are like, nah, March. Yeah. I don't need flowers. Yeah. I could go out. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think it speaks to something that we're seeing here too, that people really, really, they're curious, but they also really want to help and be involved and like that eagerness of getting out there when it was hard <laughs> early on in the season. I, I know a lot of people who um, I feel have probably responded the same way. Yeah. Um, and we've got some questions coming in. So one of them is from Kari curious about uh, if this is something similar to what the museum has planned on the horizon. <laughs> so what I would say is one of the things I noticed about your timeline, Josie, is that your first volunteer training occurred uh, basically two years after the fires, right? Yeah, so we were actually a little late on the get-go, um, relatively speaking to some of those, you know, like the Fasalia that only shows up in the first year. But yeah, our first um, survey was in 2020 and the fire was officially extinguished in 2018. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's, so we uh, were super eager <laughs> um, after our fires and start. I mean, we talked to you in September of 2020. Um, and one of the things that we realized early on is that uh, the land managers who um, are responsible for the, the areas that burned, so these public areas that potentially could have people come onto them, have a lot <laughs> on their plates, especially early on after the fires. And so um, we have been in different stages throughout our planning process. And so the version that we launched this spring was something that was, what can we do now to help residents who live within the burn zone, who can, who are actively like surrounded by this phenomena, um, empower them to make useful observations and then what can we do to like help inform our community about what's going on so that they have a better understanding better motivation and just prepare them for when more opportunities arise so to answer your question Kari <laughs> um, yeah we would love to do what uh, Josie and her team are doing at the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden and we do have um, some kind of uh, adaptations of our initial project in the works and constantly just waiting for more access to be allowed for places. One of the things that Josie was mentioning was that a lot of the land that burned in the Thomas fire are these scrub lands, this chaparral, and like specifically mentioned that there isn't tree cover. A lot of the areas that burned in the CZ lightning complex fires are 
redwood forest with high intensity fire in some parts. And so I'm sure a lot of you joining us today have already heard about the issues of continuous tree falls occurring in so much of the burn zone. So that's one of the reasons why access is still limited and will probably be more limited in our area for a longer time than you might see in a grassland area or a chaparral area. So um, I will say that there are definitely a lot of uh, groups and researchers who are out doing this research. So don't feel like we're like missing an opportunity, but like Josie was saying, if you've got community scientists helping you, then you've got a lot more boots on the ground. So um, we do have access to certain parts of the burn zone. Uh, parts of Rancho del Oso are open, parts of Butano State Park are open, the Bonnie Doon Ecological Reserve is open, and uh, the Fall Creek unit of Henry Cowell will likely open up sooner rather than later. There's a lot of work going on there. So there will be more opportunities. Um, and then Kari is also curious, Josie, can you talk about what sort of training you gave your wonderful volunteers? Great question. Uh, so I will say we were pretty light on the training, um, especially in year two where it was all virtual, but um, we did provide a booklet. Uh, and if you visit our FIRE website on the SBBG website, um, you can take a look at those booklets. Obviously they're for the species that are down here, but we provided essentially um, just a, you know, an ID guide of what does this plant look like? When are you gonna expect to see it flowering? Um, what are the different parts on it, et cetera. Uh, that was most of the plant ID training we offered. And then a lot of it came through actually in iNaturalist afterwards. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, my advice was take a look at the booklet. Let me know if you have any questions. We did do some sort of very brief whirlwinds of, um, you know, going through the species via a, a Zoom PowerPoint. Um, the field trainings, obviously, we were able to look at the specimens in, in the field, and that was only three hours. But um, on iNaturalist, after you post a, an observation, you can take a stab at what it is. You can make a guess. Um, they have a computer vision model that'll take a look at the photo and say, based on what's around, I think this might be, you know, whatever. Um, and so a lot of people would put computer vision guesses in, but a lot of the training and learning actually came after um, when I would be online, you know, late into the night going, oh, that's actually a Centaria melatensis. You can <laughs> tell because the spines are a different color and, um, you know, the basal rosette of that plant looks more like this than like that. Um, so a lot of the, the training, uh, I think a lot of the knowledge gain for our volunteers came um, mid-project. And those who were super enthusiastic, we had quite a few people who were super jazzed and did their trail multiple times or asked for another trail. Uh, I could see that folks, uh, there's one particular comparison. Do I have a photo of Arundo in here? I might zip my Arundo photo uh, if I can. I don't know if folks know what Arundo looks like, but it's, um, it's a really big grass and we have a native grass that looks very similar, but is not quite as large. And so I'd often end up posting, hey, just so you know, this looks more like Lamus condensatus than like a rendo. One easy way to tell is if you hold your hand up to the leaf blade, if the leaf blade is only one to two fingers wide, it's probably Lamus. If it's bigger, it's probably a rendo. Um, and it was great to see that after I gave that tip, people were like, oh, cool. And they would start logging it as a Lamus instead of as a rendo on their next hike. So. That was pretty cool. Um, but yeah, I, I will admit that we did not give a super thorough, heavy training. And it was a lot of it was on our volunteers and they did amazingly. Yeah, I think that's the thing about community science is that it's really like acknowledging that your community is filled with with people who have a lot to offer and uh, and just putting a little trust in them can go a long way. But I, I for one, as someone who is still very much trying to learn our local flora and fauna here. I love it when people add IDs to my observation and I love it when they do so with a comment. It is so great. And um, that's one of the things that I hope to uh, integrate more moving forward is um, roping in some partners and also volunteers to help add those identifications. Cause I think that does, that can go a long way. Um, yes. 
And also I will also share that. Let me share my screen really. Oops. Oh yeah. I'm going to stop sharing your screen because you're sharing oh, it. Really yes. quick. That's okay. Um, <laughs> and just share that we've got an event on Saturday and it's, it's got this cutesy name because we want families to come. Um, but it really is one of the main goals of it is so that people who are wanting more resources for a naturalist and more um, direct like conversation with someone about their questions. Like, so if you're someone who's been using iNaturalist, but you still have questions about it or someone who's started to use it, um, and aren't sure if you're going about it the right way, this is a great opportunity to come speak with the museum staff and get some tips and then put it in practice in our native plant garden. Um, so I will include a link to this in our follow-up email um, and I'll also include that I, I know I saw Keith added it in the chat so thanks for that Keith um, but resources from the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden too um, and then Sarah is wondering do you know if the maps at the end were made with ArcGIS or was it a different software uh, if you are referring to the um, spatial models um, the processing of the data occurred in Arc Pro. Um, but the data platform is databasein for sharing the data widely. Um, you do not need special software to look at those in databasein. They're not currently public, but we're hoping to have all of this sort of wrapped up, analyzed, and out to the public in February so that anyone can look at the model to help them make decisions about how to manage their land if they're near or in the fire scar. Cool. Yeah, that's great. Um, and also, I like what you said at some point too about how it's useful for your project goals and then for these land managers who are going to use your report, but also when you use something like iNaturalist, that data is there for anyone to use and find use in. And so even if, uh, you know, for the Santa Cruz community that maybe you're contributing right now and you're not really sure how it's going to be used or if it's going to any particular project like this, like I, I think it's really powerful to be a part of a project like this because you can really like have the sense that it's it's meeting some end. Um, but the great thing about iNaturalist is that it's always kind of meeting some end because there are always people out there looking um, and and finding meaning in what you're what you're putting out there. And what you said about invasive plants not being recorded nearly enough. That's the thing that my big takeaway in recent years has been that we all want to go take the picture of the calicordis lily you know it but um i've been trying to when i go out and i'm using our naturalist also take pictures of things that i know are non-native or that i know are invasive or that i just like aren't i'm not interested in too sometimes <laughs> where it's just like that green thing that yep. blends in with all the other green things um and it's helpful for me to learn those those plants but also um, yeah, we've been finding that that's where some big holes are. There was for the CZU lightning complex burn zone. I think we had some interns who were looking at pre-fire data for, I think it was like three years before the fire. And there were seven occurrences, I believe it was of, um, French broom in the whole mm. burn zone. And there's, there's a lot more French broom than yep. seven <laughs> occurrences. Yeah. It's so much of it, I think, is people walk by a weed and even if you know what it is, you're just like, oh yeah, I know that that's up in location Y. Everyone knows that. Yeah. And then you go to the records and you're like, oh my gosh, no one has recorded that it's there, even though it's been there for 30 years and everyone knows it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And if like a place like the Bondini Ecological Reserve, we've been going there pretty much every month with groups of people since March. And uh, yeah, I have to remind myself like, if I see some French broom, take a picture because <laughs> that's really important to know. Um, and then I also was just curious um, a little bit, Josie, about your history with Santa Cruz because you've been sharing with us your current community, which is so interesting to get this little vacation, uh, go down to Santa Barbara for the evening. But um, can you share a little bit about what your work was in Santa Cruz when you were um, in school up here? Yeah, so I did a PhD at UC Santa Cruz, go banana slugs. Um, I studied in the environmental studies department and I looked at uh, the effects of grazing and climate change on coastal prairies. So up in Northern California, y'all get a lot of great rain. Uh, we don't get as much of that down here, 
but you get um, beautiful coastal prairies with this fantastic native species in them. Um, and I was uh, working with Gray Hayes and Karen Hall to look at how those native species responded to grazing. And then I also did a, um, a long-term study with a couple long-term data sets from around the Northern California, sort of central Northern Bay area, um, how those grasslands are changing over time. Yeah. So. Is it when you came to the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden, was that before the fires or did you come because of the fires? Oh, that's actually very <laughs> funny in a kind of dark way. <laughs> oh. I moved to Santa Barbara because there was a fire in my apartment complex that left the building condemned. So oh. an interesting relationship with fire there. <laughs> oh, no. But I moved down to Santa Barbara um, because my partner had been working remote, which now he, we all get to do. So there's yeah. just a lot of fun layers here. <laughs> yeah, um, I guess I, um, one of the things that's been coming up in our conversations with, because we've done so many fire related programs over the past year, um, is this 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 uh, kind of correlation between our research on just disturbance in general on a landscape, so something like grazing, versus the research on fire, and how sometimes they're kind of like, um, you know, you just think about disturbance in general, and so what disturbance leads to for, for a landscape, but how grazing can be very different <laughs> from fire, and so it just seems like an interest that you've come kind of, uh, you've found yourself on a on a different some disturbance path <laughs> from what you yeah. started with. It's, I, I always think of, um, you know, there's like a spectrum of conservation to restoration. It's a spectrum. Maintenance falls somewhere in there. And all these yeah. terms kind of uh, sort of reflect a lot of the same concepts, but just in different settings. Yeah. Something I think about a lot. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, and I got one last question, unless, and if anyone else has a question uh, that they want to put in the chat, please do. But um, kind of pivoting off of that, uh, I know, so you've been talking about the Santa Barbara region and your findings there. What are the takeaways that we in Santa Cruz can have from, from your research, knowing that our landscape, as you've been sharing, is very different from your landscape? What do you think there is to learn um, or to like move forward with up here? Yeah. Um... Something that I think of right away is just the timescales that I think of for some of the ecosystems that y'all have up there. Um, Redwood forest is, you know, lasts a long time. And I know that the fire cycle up there is also um, historically a much longer cycle than what we have down here. And so I think if anything, y'all have an even more interesting and exciting opportunity to look at how these events are changing your systems because you've got a very different system that while perhaps adapted to fire is not, um, a lot of places in the Thomas fire are still in their 30 year to 100 year cycle. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think a lot um, up in Santa Cruz might not be within that cycle uh, within your natural range. And so I think you've got an even more interesting opportunity to answer some really interesting questions about where the earth is headed. Yeah. Yeah, lots to do, lots to learn. But yeah, I, I that's something that I've been trying to tell myself over this past year that like, yes, there's a lot to learn within the first year, but there's always there's still a lot to learn in the year to follow, and the year to follow, and the year to follow. And I was, you know, in the Eastern Sierras uh, almost a year ago now, and looking at a 30 year fire scar there where there's still evidence. Um, of it near Rainbow Falls and Devil's Post Pile, and they've got interpretation. And I was thinking, I was right after the fires here and thinking about how, like, this is a long story, these fires. Um, so I will leave it at that for now. And um, again, I'm going to be following up with an email tomorrow. I hope to include the recording from tonight's presentation in that email. There will be a survey. If you can give us some feedback, that would be much appreciated. And then again, um, I really encourage you all to join us for a fun morning looking at bugs and plants um, and birds at the museum on Saturday. Nothing but good times to be had there. Um, and I hope you'll continue on with us on this journey, uh, figuring out how we can be useful uh, in our own fire landscape. So Josie, any last words? No, no, thank you all for having me. It's been great. Really appreciate it. This is wonderful. And um, I'm gonna kick out everyone joining us. So that's gonna kick you out too, Josie. So. 
this is good night from us at the museum and uh, hope to, to see you again and work with you again in the future. Sounds good. See you. Bye, everyone.